Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the wind and refresh. Come as the fire and burn. Convict, convert, and consecrate many hearts and lives to thy great good and to our great good and to thy greater glory. In this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. I don't know what they're going to do today, <clears throat> but I know that uh, the Houston Texans are going to demonstrate today. I'm not a Houston Texans fan, not even relevant, but they've already announced that they are going to demonstrate an act of protest in response to something the owner of their franchise said about players this week. This is in large part in response to the stories that have been going on throughout the whole of the NFL season around the decision of players to make protest and then the later politicization of that from its original meaning, at least what we thought it was from Colin Kaepernick taking a knee in response a year ago as his expression around issues of injustice and treatment of the law enforcement community. Rightly or wrongly, that was the original intent. So I have no idea what they're going to do today, but trust me, if you turn on your TV at all, you're going to know. It's going to be shown in every regard that these players who are, whose owners said you can't let the inmates run the prison, which is a mixed kind of, I don't think he had the, the image right, but the meaning hurts still, and the meaning is wrong still, and they're going to have an act of protest. And the question that I have for you this morning is, what do you think about that? Not what they do, but should they? You know, in the face of all the protests that have been going on in the last year or so, and they seem to be increasing, we are protesting women got in the streets right after inauguration. Um, around the whole Black Lives Matter conversation of, of closing roads and bridges to say, stop this enough, we shall be heard. A group of brothers and sisters in the faith who gathered in Shelbyville and Murfreesboro yesterday, so powerful it seems with their witness, at least in Murfreesboro, that the alt-right just said, forget about it already, all right. However it is you approach the question of protest, whether one should or shouldn't, I've noted that not only is the angst that drives people to want to say a thing heightened in this day and time, the need to demean and discredit those who feel the need to speak out is also ever louder, uh, more vindictive, very mean-spirited, and it struck me on today, this Sunday, as we recognize the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther walking up to the Wittenberg Chapel door and nailing, nailing into the door, all right, just, you know, how we can't put anything up in a church without a committee's approval, nailing into the door his 95 theses, his complaints, against the church. They're starting a period of several decades that we call the Protestant Reformation. Do you know what you call those who can't handle those who protest today and work to discredit it and demean them? You know what you call those? You know what you call that? It's irony. Especially if those who are discrediting protesters are Protestants themselves. Protestants, products of protest, can't handle protest. So I, I live with this question today. It, it's historic. We, we, um, we are heirs of what Luther did. 
500 years ago. You may not think of these as revolutionary things, but in the day and time in which they occurred, they did. The fact that you have a Bible at home that you can read in your first language, you can think, not just him alone, there was the whole printing press deal, but Luther was the conduit to push for that to happen. The idea that Justification by faith through grace alone is what brings us in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It wasn't begun with Martin Luther, but it was nailed to the door and became a plank of belief for we who are in this room today. Uh, Mr. Wesley picked up on it pretty largely and expounded upon it himself. The belief that you don't need me to get to God. And you don't need to pay indulgences to pay for the depth of your own shortcomings to have access to God is a byproduct of the Protestant Reformation. The belief that Scripture alone, sola scriptura, is the authority for how we understand and frame our beliefs and who God is and how we engage the world, a product of the Protestant Reformation. Now, true enough, Christians today will argue plenty about what scriptural authority means. That is among the arguments being had right now in our beloved United Methodist Church, uh, to which I say, let's go. Let's have that conversation. Because in the end, however it is you understand protest, there are at least these things I want you to come away with from a biblical perspective, a church history perspective, but something that is as current as what is happening today, be it that which will be broadcast all over every news outlet today because of something that football players choose to do or not to do, to those who just want to sing a message of love and faith in Murfreesboro amidst messages of hate that wanted to march down the street. To the conversation that you might have with someone who might say a thing that you know in your heart is not gospel. And you have to make a decision about whether or not you just let it slide or you offer protest about what you understand to be true about the nature of God. Protest to speak out loud, to say it publicly. Protest to speak truth that needs to be spoken lest it not be said at all. Protest to say a word that has been too long silenced protest. The recent revelations wrapped up in no small part by the hashtag me too in recent days. Is that not protest finally and the liberation of those who felt too silenced to ever say out loud what happened to them is now being said. It is protest of another kind, but oh, let me tell you, it is protest. And thank God it is being spoken. What is it then, sisters and brothers, in your life, this context, this place, this time, this country, in your heart, from your heart, do we need to say out loud? That's 
partly the discernment of your own heart, to be sure. But the one thing I would want you to hear this morning is that if we are the sanctuary we claim we are, trust then that whatever it is you need to say, you are safe to say it here. It is not enough for us to feel as if though we, we can occupy the same space together and just kind of tolerate each other when we're different. I hate the word to tolerate. I hate tolerance as a word. Tolerance might be mannerly. Tolerance is not Christian. Tolerance does not equal acceptance. I, I, can, I can tolerate some food. And the older I get, I'm noticing that there's some I can't tolerate quite as much anymore as once I could. Part of the question the United Methodist Church needs to ask itself right now is it discerns the way forward. I'm not looking for a church that can tolerate each other. I'm looking for a church that accepts one another. And I'm willing to protest to make that voice heard. I'm not trying to tell you you're wrong. I'm trying to tell you what I believe in my heart the gospel compels. It's wrapped up right here in these words. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the greatest commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All this other petty stuff is just that, petty. Whatever it is that motivates you this morning to say a word about what's wrong in the world, what's wrong in the church, and there's some of us who live in that space and find too much strength in it, it is not enough for us to say what is wrong in the world and wrong with the church because we are people of gospel, so our message must be one of aspiration and of hope and of what we can yet be. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Gospel people are always looking toward what shall be in the fulfillment of God's creation of which we are called to be architects to help build. I can stand here and tell you that I think the language that says incompatible with Christian teaching is abhorrent, and by God it is, but that's not enough. I gotta tell you what a church that opens its heart and life to everyone looks like that pushes us a little bit closer to who we're called to be. It does not make us less godly, oh my, it makes us far more godly than we've ever been. So let our protest that we make be aspirational. But to do that, we have to get over the anger that drives our need to protest in the first place and the fear to offer a counter vision of what shall be. Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, she's from the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, and so as you might imagine, the whole Protestant Reformation is like their Woodstock right now. There are, there, are, there are celebrations all over the place out of the Lutheran Church around, um, of, around this anniversary, this 500-year anniversary. And uh, her sermon around this occasion, a couple of things she says. She says, ah, Reformation Sunday, time to celebrate everything Lutheran Bring out the red vestments and paraments. Bring on the extra brass. Fire up the choir. Sing the fight song. A mighty fortress is our God. <laughs> and follow the Reformation scriptural texts. 
It is, you can see them walk into that annual acknowledgement of this event in the history of the church. And of all the things that are both pro and con, the consequences and the unintended consequences of Protestant Reformation, and there are many, there are many, for all that is good and what seems theologically obvious to us that I enumerated earlier, think about the unintended consequences of Protestant Reformation, of schism upon schism upon schism, fractures within the body of Christ that have brought people no joy but pain. Schisms that have led to violence, that have led to war. Not everything that came out of the Protestant Reformation was glowing. It was difficult. It is that for which we should, even in this moment, be prepared to offer confession and repentance for the ways in which we seek to divide a body that Christ came to give himself for to make whole. But to the good, she argues that the Protestant Reformation at its core is about freedom, she says. This view of freedom, that freedom is the problem Freedom as a problem is well illustrated by Robert Capon in his book, Between Noon and Three, and he writes, if we ever, if we are ever to enter fully into the glorious liberty of the children of God, we are going to have to spend more time thinking about freedom than we do. The church, by and large, has a poor record of encouraging freedom. She has spent so much time inculcating us in fear, in the fear of making mistakes, that she has made us like ill-taught piano students. We play our songs, but we never really hear them because our main concern is not to make music but to avoid the flub that will get us into trouble. The freedom this moment gives us is to make gospel music and to tell the story at last of the one who is Messiah, son of David, who has said to us that the Shema of the Hebrew Bible is not nearly antiquated. It is the guiding rule for us in this moment now. And it is out of that that we offer, when necessary, a word to be spoken out loud, protest. This is a moment that each of us wrestles with. God, forgive us the moments of uncomfortable silence in the face of what we see in front of us that we just don't want to cause trouble. Or if I offer a counter view, they may not like me. I serve the church not too terribly long ago. After I served you and before I came back. Does that narrow it down for you? Uh, There was one particular individual with whom I had great issue and he with me. Did not inhibit my capacity to pastor him but the ways in which as uh, my then associate at the time, as you can imagine, if Laura Jean and I were going to go out to Cordova, I hope you know what you're getting. Uh, and he never quite did. And in a fit of fury with one phone call with me where he called me everything but a child of God. He said to me, but my biggest problem with you is that you're a liberal. To which I said, you say that as if that's a bad thing. He and I never quite made peace with that. And 
and I, I share that because there's a moment in each of our lives where you're, you, you're met with, what do you say? I'm sorry, I am who I am? No. No. I don't have to believe the way you believe, and you don't have to believe the way that I believe, but can we mutually agree that we're going to hold our love for Jesus as the higher plane to which we aspire? Not the love of Jesus that works within the constructs of the church the way I think it should be, but can we agree upon the love of Jesus to which we mutually aspire that makes each of us better than the other, and even at a minimum, that love of Jesus compels us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. You're not let off the hook even if you got an enemy. Jesus says love them anyway. What is the word of protest that we need to proclaim? We are going to close this morning with a statement of faith. It's in your bulletin. I don't want you to look at that this morning as the next thing in the worship order. Because creeds and statements of faith at their best are not meant to be the rote response, nor are they meant to be weaponized. If you don't believe it like this, you're not one of us. You want to know what a statement of protest is? We're about to share one. Against the principalities and powers of this world, we're about to share one. But before I do, I want to share this word as protest. There's a verse of this song that we've been singing every week. For everyone born a place at the table that we've not included in our order. I'm okay with it. I'm glad for it to be there. I'm not afraid of it being there. And my argument is from here on, it's going to be there. But I want you to hear it. For gay and for straight, a place at the table. A covenant shared, a welcoming space, a rainbow of race and gender and color for gay and for straight, the chalice of grace. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. I want to be one who gives delight to my God. And if I got to say it out loud, by God, I'm going to. Let us rise and share in this statement of faith and think of it as protest this day as we announce that we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life and death in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.